Welcome back again. So we're continuing our lectures on data visualization. And in the last lectures on uncertainty, I talked about things like uh, error bars and ways to represent uh, multiple distributions at once using uh, density plots and error plots. I want to kind of continue on that theme in this lecture and dive deeper into how to, how to visualize distributions when you have a, a larger number of distributions that you want to compare uh, to each, each other. And so we, we ended a little bit of that in the distribution where we showed that like if you plot the densities, you can plot a couple on top of each other, you know, three, four, five, uh, but, it, but that's gonna become limiting when you have a, a much larger number. So one of the most classic ways of visualizing multiple distributions is through the use of, of box plots. So here we can see in the, in the top left, uh, kind of a scatter plot of the actual raw under, underlying data. Again, the, the x-axis is just jittered uh, so we can see the spread of the data. And then we can see that the box plot is representing, uh, the, the middle line represents the me median. The, the box itself is drawn around the, the first and third quartile. So that 50% of the data falls within that box. And then uh, the, the line width kind of shows the range of the data with the exception that most box plot algorithms have some way of uh, kind of detecting outliers and plotting them as individual points. So it's not the actual absolute minimum maximum, but it um, tries to capture the, the majority of the data uh, along that line. And anything that falls outside of it is represented as an explicit plot. And so in the, the bottom right, we're seeing the ability to use box plots to represent uh, the distribution of temperature data over an annual cycle. Um, yeah, and so now, you know, visualizing 12 distributions, we can kind of do this fairly easily. And, and you know, you could argue that there's potentially more information here than just uh, looking at the error bars around the means. You can get a better feel for the shape of those distributions. And so within R, and then base R, there's a box plot function for making these sort of box plots. Uh, and within ggplot, there's a geom box plot for adding box plots uh, to ggplots. Uh, another variant of looking at this is, is to actually just look at the, the raw data itself uh, in a way where the points are jittered. So again, we're adding some noise in the x direction so that the points are just all falling on top of each other. And this is often called a strip chart. And so now, you know, we're not even, we're not calculating any sort of summary at all. We're looking at the raw data, uh, and, and using that the, visually, the kind of the density of the data to understand uh, how variable things are. In this case, we can rely on uh, just the geom point with, within ggplot to draw uh, points on a graph, and then we're adding this position jitter. Uh, to that as well. And then in base R, there's also a, a, a jitter function. I, off the top of my head, I believe it's just called jitter uh, to add jittering uh, to data. So you could do this in base R just as well. We just happen to have not covered, haven't gotten to XY plots yet, to, which is how you would do this uh, in base R. Uh, another way of visualizing multiple distributions that, that um, I've actually used a, a good bit in my lab um, is this idea of a violin plot. And so a violin plot, uh, I think I find it more informative than a traditional box plot. And so what it's doing is essentially uh, calculating a kernel density smoother uh, for the data, but instead of just showing it in one direction, it's showing it symmetrically in both directions. And so kind of the width of the violin is proportional to the amount of data, and it really is just kind of a smooth density plot and it's mirror image. Uh, plotted vertically. Uh, and in this case, we're also truncating it at the, the maximum minimum value. Uh, so we're again, like we talked about in, in densities, we don't let that let those continue. And so I guess I would argue when I look at this violin plot, I, I feel like I get a better feel uh, for the, the actual shape of those distributions than I did when I looked at the box plots. Somewhat subjective. Um, the geom violin within ggplot is a nice convenient way of making uh, violin plots. I will admit that there's not as the, the, there's not a simple base plot function for violin plots that I'm aware of. Um, 
And then, you know, the things here, you know, adjust is again, just adjusting the bandwidth. The Cena plot kind of tries to combine the best of both worlds between the violin plot and the um, strip chart and that we're, you know, we're plotting the violin plot, but then we're plotting uh, the jittered uh, data from the, the, um, the strip chart on top of it, but we're doing the jittering in a way that keeps the data points within the densities. So it's not just a, a equal width jittering. So we kind of now get to see uh, the shape of the data and the underlying data itself at once. So this is a neat, particularly neat visualization. And it is uh, generated by combining uh, the violin plot with this uh, Cena statistic uh, within another package called ggforce, which is it's outside of the base ggplot package, but it's, a, you know, it's easy to download our plots. <clears throat> so as much fun as, as violin plots are, uh, and as much as I use them in my lab, these days, I think my group is actually using what are called ridge line plots or ridge plots uh, even more than we are using violin plots. And so ridge line plots are a way of uh, plotting multiple densities uh, in a way where they're kind of staggered and offset uh, to help you visualize the density. So now we've turned things on, turned the axis on its side so the densities are, are horizontal instead of vertical like they were in the violin plot. Uh, we, they're, they're not symmetric anymore like they were in the violin plot. And then we've actually allowed them to overlap a bit. Uh, so you don't, you, you do lose something here. So like uh, in the May distribution, I can't see the right hand tail completely. It's cut off by uh, June being overlapped with it. Uh, but in general, you can see, you actually do see a lot of the, the over, you can see kind of the overall seasonal curve as well as the kind of the variability within each, each month. Uh, fairly easily. And this is uh, the geom density ridges function within ggplot is what's used to, to make these ridge plots. One of the things that's nice about ridge plots uh, compared to some of the other options is uh, in some cases, not every case, but in some cases they can uh, really scale to much larger numbers of, of densities. So here is a, a, a ridge plot of movie lengths uh, taken out of IMDb um, by year that the movie was made in and, and doing this annually uh, from like 1910 to the early uh, 2000s uh, kind of helps you easily visually see uh, how the you know the standard movie length of about 90 move minutes came into kind of became a standard in kind of uh, around 1950 and before that the movies were much more variable in length um, sometimes shorter, and then there's you know the this, this second mode of, of short films. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, these ridge plots uh, have been around a while. This is uh, what many consider the iconic album cover from Joy Division, uh, which is actually a ridge plot uh, plotting of, of pulsar data. Uh, cool. So even plots sometimes hit pop culture. So at this point. So what dated pop culture? 